Kalace Productions presents a retelling of J.R.R. Tolkien's great epic, The Lord of the Rings, but in six minutes. Frodo Baggins, a 33-year-old suburban hobbit living in the land of the Shire, is given the most powerful weapon in existence by his eccentric but very rich Uncle Bilbo, who decides to leave his hometown of Hobbiton so he can pursue his career as a writer and terrible poet. With a boatload of cash, way too much free time, and his entire life ahead of him, you would think that Frodo Baggins' best option would probably be to sit back and relax. And that's exactly what he does, for the next two decades. Frodo probably would have done nothing for the rest of his life if not for the sudden arrival of his wizard friend Gandalf. Gandalf informs Frodo that his totally harmless magic gold ring is actually the only thing the Dark Lord Sauron needs before he will be totally unstoppable. So you have to destroy it. And Frodo's like, uh, Gandalf, you have the superpowers and stuff. Wouldn't it make more sense for you to destroy it? But Gandalf's like, nah, see if anybody cool like me tries to destroy the ring, we'll turn into a new Dark Lord. For this job, we need somebody who's totally boring, and you fit the bill. Now get going before somebody else shows up here looking for your super weapon. And Frodo responds, it won't matter if I wait like six months, will it? Gandalf thinks about it and says, hmm, given the circumstances, yeah, that seems like a totally reasonable idea. And so, six months later, Frodo finally sets off from home, joined by two of his annoying cousins and his gardener. Because when you start on a dangerous quest, the people to take with you are always your irritating relatives and that one guy who mows your grass. Anyway, despite being attacked by semi-sentient trees and two different kinds of ghosts, the hobbits make it through the fabled Fangorn Forest, aided only by Tom Bombadil, a man whose poetry and fashion sense are so much more terrible than Bilbo's that the trees and ghosts are forced to let the heroes go. At last, Frodo and the company make it to the town of Bree, where they're supposed to rendezvous with Gandalf. Except Gandalf isn't there. With more ghosts chasing them and time running out, who are they going to call? Apparently, just this guy. Some park ranger who knows Gandalf. With park ranger man in tow, the company make it to their next stop, Rivendell, with Frodo only mostly dead. At Rivendell, Frodo is reunited with his uncle Bilbo and picks up a few freeloaders who want to be part of the big quest too. Now aided by a vertically and horizontally challenged warrior, a very blonde elf, the relatives, the gardener, an unreliable wizard, the park ranger, and some dude who really likes tuning his own horn. Frodo's journey was that much easier, at least until the company decides to enter a super creepy dwarf mine. After mentioning different kinds of fruit for a few hours, Gandalf figures out how to open the door. Once inside, they find out that the dwarves who lived there before have since foreclosed, and a bunch of orcs are living in the mine instead. Surprisingly, most of Frodo's friends live after the encounter, though Gandalf croaks halfway through. With Park Ranger taking the lead, the team continues into the land of Lothlorien, where they nab some funky invisibility cloaks and a jar of dirt. Apparently those cloaks don't work too well though, because two days later an army of orcs shows up and attacks. Lucky for Frodo, the orcs get rid of the annoying relatives, but he's stuck with the hedge trimmer. Deciding now is a good time to ditch the freeloaders, Frodo heads off to blow up the super weapon himself. Realizing they have been dumped, the rest of the group decide they might as well go rescue Frodo's relatives, all except for him because he gets shot. Using expert ranger skills like asking for directions, the diminished company search through Middle-earth for the missing cousins. Instead, they find an undead Gandalf, who informs them that Frodo's relatives are actually doing great. He tells them to go help out King Theoden. So they head to Rohan, where Theoden is, and convince him to get off his tush and go help his people fight Saruman, a wizard who has been trying to make himself as powerful as Sauron by taking control of stuff. For instance, King Theoden's land. With the arrival of King Theoden's midlife crisis, he decides to move his people from one ordinary-sized fortress to a slightly bigger fortress, and then finds another chair to sit on. Unsurprisingly, this doesn't work so well, because Saruman sends a ton of orcs to come and destroy their fortress. Luckily, Gandalf brings his own army to help out. After vanquishing all the orcs, the heroes plus Theoden all head to Saruman's secret base. As it turns out, all the bad guys have been destroyed by a bunch of tree people. The tree people found the relatives, who have been sitting out doing nothing but smoking. In the meantime, Saruman has been hiding out in his tower. Leaving the Ents to keep guard, most of the group prepares to battle the Dark Lord Sauron, while Gandalf and one of the cousins head to the Kingdom of Gondor to help them do the same. Meanwhile, Frodo and his gardener wander towards Mordor, with a raving lunatic called Gollum as their guide. Gollum's only real goal is to get the ring from Frodo, so it's not exactly surprising when the expert guide tries to get them killed. He fails, but Frodo is abducted, and Guy Gardner is forced to take the power ring and fight instead of Hal Jordan, I mean Frodo. Thankfully, Gardner is able to rescue his friend, and they continue their trek across Mordor to Mount Doom. In the meantime, Gandalf and the relative reach Gondor to help out, but they find that the steward of Gondor has lost all hope. This is because the steward has a palantir, basically a buggy fortune cookie, that has told them there are a bunch of ships approaching to help the already numerous forces of Sauron attack Gondor. What none of them realize, though, is that the ships that the steward saw on his palantir were actually good guys, led by the lone park ranger. Anyway, they eventually all decide to go storm the gates of Mordor, which is kind of suicidal, 
until the eagles arrive and help out. At about the same time, Frodo and his sidekick make it to the top of Mount Doom, thanks to the, um, help of a well-timed golem. Despite everything exploding, the eagles are still able to grab the heroes and get them to safety. With everybody mostly intact, the heroes regroup at Gondor for a bit, and then the hobbits head back home. But if you think the story is over there, think again. As the hobbits travel home, they're stopped at the entrance of the Shire by armed hobbits who tell them that they can't get in past curfew. But our heroes are no longer ordinary hobbits. They've faced orcs and other unusual creatures, so they forage ahead. They head to the house of Farmer Cotton, a local whom they met at the beginning of their journey. Cotton explains that the Shire has been taken over, and the heroes gather that the new chief of the region goes by the name Sharky. When given this news, Frodo and company are just like, seriously? So one of the relatives heads off to go grab an army of his buddies, and they fight the forces of Sharky in what would later be called the Battle of Bywater. They then head to Hobbiton, where the mysterious Sharky is. As it turns out, Sharky is none other than Sauron. The guy was so mad at the hobbits for destroying all his evil plans and his house that this entire time he's been taking over their home. Frodo tells his forces not to kill Saruman, but it doesn't really matter because Saruman's psychic decides to stab him. The only big part remaining is Frodo's departure from Middle-earth. With Bilbo, Elrond, Galadriel, and Gandalf, Frodo leaves Middle-earth to travel into the west. And for those of you who've seen my Silmarillion video, you might guess where he's traveling to. Valinor, the land of the Valar, which is actually kind of cool. After that, the story is mostly over. In the end, Frodo was able to escape his gardener and his relatives.